Paul Fotenauer and welcome to Frontiers, where we showcase UC Davis research that helps us understand and live in a changing world. We have a serial killer in our midst. It is West Nile virus, a disease carried by mosquitoes that first appeared in the U.S. in 1999. In just four years, it spread from New York to California. West Nile virus inflicts its worst harm on birds, horses, and humans. It can cause serious damage to the central nervous system and even death. In 2005, in the U.S., there were 3,000 human cases of West Nile virus and 119 deaths. This year, we may exceed those numbers. Joining us today is Bill Risen, a research entomologist at the UC Davis Center for Vector-Borne Diseases and the leader of the research team that discovered the first mosquito in California infected with the West Nile virus. And Kira Simmons is a UC Davis staff researcher. Fifteen months ago, Kira developed a particularly nasty case of the disease. We'd like to welcome both of you to Frontiers. Thank you very much. Bill, I'd like to start with you. If you could sort of give us an assessment of how we did in California here this past summer with the West Nile virus. Well, in uh, 2005, Sacramento was more or less the epicenter for the state with hundreds of human cases. Uh, consistent with the pattern we've seen across the United States in the year following an epidemic, there's a general subsidence, but the virus tends to track uh, naive populations of birds that have not been exposed previously and it moved across the Yolo bypass into Yolo County this year and as far as the incidence was concerned with the lower population there was probably just as much of a case incidence rate in Davis this summer as there was in Sacramento last year. Now, now Kira, you have a fascinating tale to tell, uh, one that has caused you a lot of pain and suffering over the past 15 months. You actually contracted a nasty virus. It was the West Nile. You didn't know it at the time. Tell us about it. I actually had, uh, in the end, a West Nile neuroinvasive disease. Uh, I didn't find out that I had the disease or had recovered from the disease until I came to work at the Center for Vector-Borne Diseases. But about 15 months ago, um, I came down with a rash that covered my entire body. Um, I figured it was from an antibiotic that I'd been on, so I quit taking that, took an antihistamine to relieve those symptoms and no relief. Did you think that that mosquito bite that you had incurred might have contributed to the way you were feeling? No, actually, no, I didn't. Uh, not at the time. Um, a couple days later when I developed more symptoms, I, I got a headache, a horrible headache that wasn't relieved by any medication that I took. Um, developed a fever that eventually reached 106.5. I knew that something was more serious than a reaction to an antibiotic. Um, I went to the emergency room about two days after the symptoms started. I was given IV fluids. Uh, blood was drawn for a West Nile virus test, but that sample never went anywhere. It was never processed. Uh, if it had been processed, you would have known early on that you had West Nile virus. I would have. I wouldn't have gone a week and a half with a fever of 106, uh, severe headaches, uh, dizziness, nausea, vomiting. Um, I lost 20 pounds in a week and a half. Um, those symptoms, I would think, would not have gotten quite as serious as they were. Now, I assume you missed a lot of work in this time? I did. I did. I missed uh, a week and a half for the illness itself between start of symptoms and eventual admission to the hospital after four emergency room visits. After that, my recovery was slow. It took about two months before I was back to work, before I was able to drive uh, because the dizziness was so bad I couldn't keep my balance, before the headaches subsided. So when did you finally discover that you had West Nile? About uh, two or three months after I, I was fully recovered and back to work at the School of Medicine, um, I took a job working at the Center for Vector-Borne Diseases with Bill. And it wasn't until about f five or six months after that that um, I had a routine blood test given to all employees to monitor their immune status there at work uh, that we found out that I had a huge infection to West Nile. Now, are you still suffering the effects of uh, West Nile virus? I am. I am. I didn't know it at first. Uh, a few months ago, I started keeping track of the symptoms I was having. Uh, frequent headaches, frequent being about three or four times a week, sometimes to the intensity that I can't walk. I basically just lay there. <laughs> um, dizzy spells that uh, render me incapable of working in um, the, the hood that I do in the laboratory. Um, I started recording all of these things. I recording um, what I eaten that day, how much sleep I had received, the stress level I was under, the activity I was doing at the time to see if I could correlate it in any way, and I haven't been able to. Mm -hmm. So I, the more reading I've done, I've also realized that these are, are long-term um, symptoms or uh, effects of West Nile virus. Now, Bill, Kira's young. Is there a certain or a typical demographic uh, that 
West Nile virus seems to be particularly, that, that it targets a certain age group? Well, it's an equal opportunity virus as far as infection, but the age groups that show more severe disease are more my cohort than cures. And uh, young, healthy individuals her age usually don't, are the ones least apt to become ill. Uh, the, the median age for West Nile fever is somewhere around 50 years of age. Uh, these are ones with clinical symptoms that get diagnosed by the medical profession. And the uh, neuroinvasive disease is somewhat older, I'm not exactly sure, somewhere around 60, 65 years of age. So um, we were surprised, you know, it was unlikely that uh, Kira would have had this degree of illness, but it doesn't matter, your, your health status is immaterial, and that there's been high school athletes that have wound up in an iron lung with polio type symptoms as a sequelae to their, to their illness. Do you think the medical profession is becoming more aware of the importance of doing these blood tests when you come down with symptoms like you had? I think this year it seems like they have been. I've heard of more people being tested for it. Uh, I think that's the reason my diagnosis was missed. I was young, I was generally healthy. Um, I had classic West Nile symptoms, the rash, the headache, the fever, the weight loss, all of that, but it was still missed because I think at that time, doctors were still looking for horses when they heard hoof beats rather than zebras. <laughs> and Bill, specifically, how does the virus spread? Well, um, it's, the basic cycle is uh, between Culex mosquitoes and the birds they feed on. Uh, the other mosquitoes that people may encounter, such as at high elevations hiking, are really not involved in the cycle. So it's a very specific cycle uh, and specifically for certain mosquitoes that are susceptible to infection. The species of birds involved is also uh, very specific and some of the, the basic cycle seems to involve uh, house finches and house sparrows, these little paradomestic uh, birds you find around your home. And then if, as the virus enters into areas where there are communal roosts of uh, birds such as American crows or magpies, these birds will have up to 10 billion particles of virus in their blood by the time they die uh, per milliliter of blood and so they're just essentially a sack of virus and they'll get ill and land in people's yards and then infect any mosquito that feeds on them with so much virus. So these these foci of birds then amplify the virus and when they go out to forage from the communal roost and then become ill, they don't return, so they can move the virus. And some of these, some of these foraging ratios around these centroid uh, roosts may be 20 kilometers, so it's not small distances. So that there's this movement out and then this renewal of transmission at those sites and, and, and a further movement there. So the work that you're doing in your lab, what are you doing? How are you trying to approach this, this virus and, and getting more information. Is it a difficult process scientifically? Well, we uh, set when about the time the virus came in, as you mentioned, we discovered it in the southeastern deserts. We had, we had received a large NIH grant to track West Nile's movement and invasion into California, and we set up study areas in Imperial County, Coachella Valley, the maritime biome of highly urbanized Los Angeles, uh, the southern San Joaquin and Bakersfield, and then in Sacramento and Yolo County. And that is essentially the route the virus took. In 2004, the epicenter was in Los Angeles, where it was involved with high, in this highly urbanized environment involving one species of urban mosquito. It moved into Bakersfield and, then the, and, and Sacramento, and then more rural mosquitoes became involved. So there's a variety of temperature regimes, the way the virus has to persist. There's different bird species it's exploited, but it's managed, and our research has been really to track this whole movement and decide how the virus persists and then amplifies to levels to and start infecting humans like poor Kira. What don't you know about West Nile virus? Well, one of the things that's still uh, very difficult to understand is where it is when we can't find it. And during the winter months, uh, when it's too cold for the virus to grow in mosquitoes, it's very hard to find where it is. And uh, a winter focus of our research has been trying to decide how it uh, how it spends the winter. And there, in 
up north it may spend the winter in hibernating mosquitoes whereas down in areas like Los Angeles there may be just a very low level of continued transmission but we're still trying to gain data on this as to how the virus does this. We're also interested in virus evolution as to whether or not the virus West Nile virus will persist in this highly virulent form for birds and humans or whether it will over time attenuate to where it will no longer be killing birds. And so we're, uh, with my colleague Aaron Brawl, we've been studying the fitness of these emerging attenuated strains in North America. Now that Kira has had the West Nile virus, uh, is she immune to it and, and will never have a problem with it? Well, never is a long time, but certainly <laughs> right now uh, she's the safest person in our lab because no one else has antibodies. And the purpose of vaccination is actually to simulate an illness like without the symptoms and develop the immune response so that then you're, then you're protected. This is what we're doing to the, to, uh, to the American horse herd right now. There's two commercially available vaccines and anybody with a valuable horse has vaccinated it and, and boosted annually to keep the antibodies at a protective level. So how close are we to a human vaccination? Well, it's easy to produce a human vaccine, but it's less likely that we will infect the human pop, uh, that we will vaccinate the human population in North America because the infection rate during epidemics has been so low. So in the Bronx where the initial outbreak was, they, they had 2.6% of the Bronx population was estimated to be infected. So at that low an infection rate, vaccinating an entire population was seemed to be less warranted. The vaccine might be used for people that are in harm's way due to their profession or their just general risk like care for working in laboratories. Are you in your lab looking at this virus at the gene level? And if you are, why is that important? Well, in our lab, we're, uh, our lab being inclusive of Dr. Brault, who's the molecular geneticist in our midst, uh, we are looking at this to see how the virus will change and if it will continue to be such a high risk uh, of a pathogen for public health. Uh, St. Louis encephalitis, which is endemic to the United States for years, uh, has strains that are relatively attenuated and doesn't that doesn't cause illness in birds and uh, the human uh, effect of infection is much less than what we're seeing with West Nile virus. So just having knowledge of how this is, how the epidemic's progressing and how it will subside and then uh, uh, persist in the United States is sort of one of our objectives. Now Kara, what, what advice would you give to people so that they do not contract this disease? I think people have heard a lot of messages about draining standing water on their properties, ensuring that your screens are, are secure so that mosquitoes can't enter your residence. They've heard about using DEET, wearing long sleeves, long pants. I think above and beyond that, um, people need to be their own advocates. They need to, when they know they're sick, their body, something is not right with it, they are the best judge and they need to insist on proper medical care because I think I slipped through the cracks. Um, the medical profession's responsibility, or one of them, is to serve as the first barrier against epidemics. And I believe they are required to, to report, excuse me, report West Nile virus infections, and they drop mine. If they drop mine, I'm sure there were a slew of other 20-somethings, 30-somethings, 40-somethings who were healthy, who also were not treated, not reported. It's so hot in this environment in the valley. Uh, people don't want to wear long pants, don't want to wear long sleeve shirts. So does DEET work? DEET does work, and there are varying concentrations, everything from 2% to 100% DEET, things that can offer you protection for 20 minutes up to 10 hours with heavy sweating. So there really is no reason not to use some form of protection. And now that you had uh, and still continue to suffer the after effects of the, the virus, uh, has this kind of renewed your desire and interest to, to get into that lab and really try to find out some of these unanswered questions that Bill was talking about? It's definitely piqued my curiosity when it comes to research. Uh, when it comes to surveillance of mosquitoes and uh, birds throughout the state, it's made me really realize how important it is that surveillance goes on. Now, Bill, you had mentioned earlier about the role of large groups of birds that, that roost together. 
Why is that a concern of yours? Well, the, this, these are areas where we may see bird-to-bird -bird transmission, bird-to-mosquito transmission, and just like it's just like pouring gasoline on a fire, just getting these flashes of viral amplification where it will just rapidly, under the proper temperature regimens, take off. And uh, these are also perhaps targets for intervention as well. In other words, if we can show over the landscape areas that are more uh, have higher rates of transmission. This gives organized mosquito control targets of intervention by trying to eliminate the infected mosquitoes in those areas, much like they, uh, due to the data, surveillance data last year, they decided to uh, aerially spray the, the city of Davis to uh, eliminate the infected mosquitoes. And that seemed to have worked rather well. And uh, it's from my understanding that there's been no more Case, human cases have occurred after in Davis after that particular spray, so it seemed to have broken the train of transmission rather well. How has it affected you to have Kira, who has suffered from West Nile virus, working in your lab? Does it change anything for you? Well, it brings, uh, we, we who study ecology and epidemiology are always talking about numbers of cases. When you see someone suffering from it, it brings the case to life. I mean, people often say, well, what's, why are we worried about West Nile? There's uh, more people get hit by drunk drivers or there's other problems in our society, but it's not until it's your friend or your mother that uh, that's in the hospital and really suffering do you really appreciate the impact of the disease and how it can change people's lives. What's the outlook for next year? Well, I think the, we're in a subsidence mode in general in California. Uh, I think that they're due to, uh, we're in an, also in an El Nino phase. So if we have enhanced uh, rain and larger mosquito populations, and we haven't had, as I mentioned, 2004, the epicenter was in Los Angeles and, and there was a lot of transmission in Southern California. We've now had time for those bird populations to resolve the antibody, uh, antibody rates have become lower in these areas may be where the virus may uh, amplify next. Uh, sort of an unknown thing and this is why it's important to uh, have the surveillance programs that we participate in and it's important for the public to keep turning in, calling in about those dead birds so we know where the virus is at and how much is there. And Kira, are you feeling stronger? Uh, I think I'm getting better. I'm discovering more and more symptoms every day that I can't attribute to other, other things, and um, I think I'm getting better. Well, we certainly <laughs> wish the best for you and your health, Thank and you uh, continue good work in your lab. We appreciate uh, the time you've taken with us on Frontiers. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us. And thanks to all of you who joined us for today's discussion. You can learn more about this subject by visiting our website at frontiers.ucdavis.edu. Many people have pet cats and dogs, and some people like me have more than one. But a few people have a mental illness that makes them accumulate dozens of cats or dogs to the point where the animals are neglected and sick and a hazard to the neighborhood. Our guest today is Kathy Toft, a UC Davis expert on population ecology, the complex relationships that connect plant and animal communities. In the past few years, she unexpectedly has also become an expert on animal hoarding, the psychological disorder that causes people to keep far more pets than they can care for. Kathy, welcome to Frontiers. And we need to uh, welcome Scotty, your rough coat collie. Tell me how the two of you met. Okay, today is a really special day because we met exactly two years ago today when Animal Services confiscated him and about 70 other collies from the owner under suspicion of animal cruelty. So what kind of abuse issues uh, affected Scotty? Okay, so what you see here is pretty typical of dogs that are kept in very crowded conditions. And consider that the, he was kept in kennels that were never cleaned, and so he had very, very dirty, itchy skin. And one thing that you find very remarkable about these dogs is that, I don't know, can you see that he has no teeth here? They're all gone, and that's from chewing on his hair. So the skin is in very, very itchy, and they're chewing constantly. How about the muzzle? So you also see a lot of scars here on his muzzle and a typical kind of arrangement that this owner had would be five 
adult male intact dogs would be packed into a small run that would be even small for one dog and they had to maintain relationships all the time and they did get into fighting but these are really sweet dogs and they prefer not to fight so that's a lot of stress on, on these dogs. And I know for years you have been active in collie rescue and adoption programs, but you also have acted as an expert witness uh, in court as well as to animal control officials. How did that come about? Well, it probably came about uh, serendipitously. Um, I had my first involvement with animal cruelty case through very similar to this one through belonging to a nonprofit organization called American Working Collie Association. And in hoarder cases, they are so massive and involve so many animals, and this is also an, an, an um, a obstacle to prosecuting these cases, the, the agencies simply cannot do it by themselves. So they bring in a large consortium of private citizens, volunteers, and nonprofit groups. So I helped with the adjudication of a case in Montana of a hoarder with 200 collies. And in this case, I just accidentally happened to be in the county that this person moved into and the nearest, close, the nearest collie rescue representative. Have you found that there has not been that much uh, research done on animal hoarding? You know, that, that, that's correct. The, the general um, illness of hoarding is also very poorly understood. It's a symptom of obsessive compulsive disorder. Many people hoard stuff. And there's been a lot more research on that. But when you add animals to the mix, it's a very small uh, subset of that population. And, and really very, very misunderstood for a long time because it appeared to look like other things. So Tufts University has a very active veterinary school, uh, particularly active in public policy, and they've been the leaders in this field and published the few scientific studies that, are, that have been done um, in the field. I assume that animal hoarding is a huge concern for veterinarians. Um, you know, it can be, there's a couple of things, is that veterinarians may be the first persons to recognize a hoarder, but many veterinarians are not educated into the signs of that, and so Tufts University is helping uh, veterinarians be trained to recognize hoarding. And also veterinarians can be unwitting enablers, because partly because they don't understand the symptoms and partly because they have a conflict with professional ethics. So the, the Tufts University is giving guidelines as to, to veterinarians of how you navigate that that uh, set of difficulties. So an animal hoarder can be mentally ill. They have many animals uh, at their ranch or their home, and yet they can still take them to a vet for care? That's right, actually that's right. And oftentimes they'll be able to recognize a condition but not really connect that they cause that condition. And so many of the signs of a hoarder that veterinarians should be aware of are animals coming in for very unusual conditions and particular conditions that would be simple to fix with proper care. So how common is animal hoarding? Okay, that, that's, a, that's a really good question. I think it's much more common than we even yet know. Um, it's, a, it's a secretive activity. Hoarders know that they're not, so, there's something wrong with what they're doing and they try to hide it and it's very misunderstood. But uh, I'd like to thank the media for helping us find out how common it is um, because of programs like this that provide education on the topic and also provide some exposure um, to animal hoarding to the public. So the scientists have actually used media reports to get the most accurate estimates so far of how common it is. And it seems to be around almost two cases per 100,000 people adjudicated per year. That would translate, if you could extrapolate to the whole United States, 5,000 hoarding cases adjudicated per year involving about a quarter of a million animals. And consider that, for example, the two cases that I was most involved with, that they, there was a, ho a serious hoarding situation for 10 or maybe 20 years before the cases were adjudicated. Let me ask you about the case where Scotty was rescued. In Yolo County, California, mm -hmm. there was an animal hoarder who had about 70 of these collies in just squalid conditions. Tell me what that was like when you arrived at the ranch. Okay, um, well what we observed were, were dogs um, and a couple of different kinds of, of settings, but mostly just sort of stored away in runs and kennel runs. 
and the, the runs were dark and there wasn't any easy way to clean it. And I think the most um, remarkable thing for me was the accumulation of waste. So there was no perception of cleaning the kennels. A lot, the dogs lived on a concrete run and the race, waste were accumulating through time. They weren't cleaned. And you can just imagine um, around 60 collies, and this person had more, produce a 55 gallon drum of solid waste every week. And imagine no way of really being able to deal with that in a systematic fashion and just accumulating. Kathy, is there a cure for someone who suffers from this disorder? We know there are three recognized types of animal hoarders. And the most serious kind and the kinds that usually involves criminal activity is the most resistant to treatment. Um, it involves an element of narcissist behavior, a lack of empathy and inability to focus outside of oneself. So that any time you have a person who won't recognize that there's an illness, it makes it extremely hard to treat. So the prognosis is, is very poor. And if someone thinks they're treated, can they go right back to the same bad habits? Of course. It, one of the models of animal hoarding is substance abuse and addiction. And so it's very, very common that there'll be relapses. In fact, the recidivism rate for the exploiter hoarder, the most serious kind, is close to 100%. Uh, so it's, it's a very poor prognosis. So what do you think people should do if they suspect that their neighbor or someone down the street uh, could be an animal hoarder? Okay, there's a, a variety of things that they can do. And if I can refer them to the Tufts website, um, that would be good. There's an intervention section on that. If it's family members and friends, they often don't want to bring in law enforcement and get their loved one in trouble. And a lot of times they're either enablers themselves or they're victims themselves. And so if they do want to, to, to start to get intervention, they should probably go to social services in the county, such as adult protective services. And neighbors who aren't so well acquainted with a person should go to animal services or animal control and report now what's Kathy, going on. Dogs like Scotty, can they be adopted out or do they have to have special care with someone like you? Well, we were really lucky with this case. Maybe it's because of collies, but um, almost all of the dogs, out of a total of actually 81 that were removed from this person's property, um, only four of them were truly unadoptable. So we were able to take a dog like this. I don't know if you can see how relaxed he is. He's doing really well out here in the world. And we have able to adopt them all out into loving homes. Well, Kathy, you and Scotty uh, are really a tribute to the good work that you're doing in your organizations, and we wish the best for Scotty. Thank you very much for appearing on Frontiers. Thank you. And thanks to all of you who joined us for today's discussion. You can learn more about this subject by visiting our website at frontiers.ucdavis.edu.